the OR drops to 0.65. So in this case, if the child was supplemented during the first year of life with cod liver oil, you do have a decreasing dose response and both the one to four times and the more than five times is statistically significant, as is the trend. So you, you know, this is very strong evidence that supplementation with cod liver oil during the first year of life reduces the risk in a dose response way in follow-up of these children. Well, now Finland, and we talked about how they have the most serious problem, and they took this problem very seriously, and they took it very seriously early on. And as we mentioned, they have standardized record keeping in the country. They have wonderful registries. They have typically 10 visits per child. If a mother is going to give birth, she gets enrolled in a system, and then there's usually as many as 10 visits during the first year of life, and they can follow these children throughout their lives, and they did. And what they did was they established a birth cohort. They found women in uh, Finland, 12,000 of them, who were to give birth during 1966, and they enrolled them in this long prospective study of which they would ascertain information related to exposures during that first year of life for those children and follow them up for a variety of diseases, bone diseases, but also for type 1 diabetes. So these 12,000 pregnant women and their children were followed for 30 years, all the way to 1997, for the incidence of type 1 diabetes. What did they find? Well, this is what they found. In Finland, if you were an infant, and you were followed for 30 years, and your mother gave you uh, vitamin D as a supplement irregularly as a child during that first year, your risk of type 1 diabetes dropped from, if we set this at, at 1, it dropped to 0.16. That's more than 8 out of 10 cases that didn't occur in that group because they were supplemented, and it's statistically significant. And if she was a little bit more energetic in supplementing you with vitamin D, and we don't even have a dose here, but whatever it was they were giving, giving at that time, the relative risk is 0.12, and it's statistically significant. This is a drop of 90%, 9 out of 10 cases. That's remarkable. We very often in epidemiology, you see relative risks of 1.1 and 1.2 and 1.3 and 1.4, and people are making a big deal out of it. This is almost, this is a relative risk of 9 or 10. It's, it's you know, it's, it's, it's almost flabbergasting. Yes? The dose is 1,000 units a day. All right, wonderful. We have, good. That's a, that's a key piece of information. And we'll go, we'll go, we'll go back to that notion of, do, we'll go back to that notion of dosage in a bit, because that's very, very important. This, uh, this was another analysis of those same children. And here, and maybe a member of the audience can help fill this in a little bit, but this was a, a low dose. This was vitamin D supplementation dose. What they considered low at the time, recommended and high. One of the problems with the recommended, and we'll get into this later, is the recommendation changed over time. So, you know, 1,000 we can say is a, is a good uh, midpoint on all of this story. So if they were getting the recommended amount, versus no supplementation with vitamin D, eight out of 10 cases were prevented for a relative risk of 0.2. And if they were getting a little higher dose, we're back to this 0.14. That's more than eight cases out of 10 pre prevented in a long-term, 30 years, prospective study of over 13,000 children in a country with wonderful health care that can really establish a relationship like this with more than 90% follow-up, almost no loss in terms of disease incidence and mortality. Yes? Was this just during the first year of the vitamin D supplementation? Yes. This was just vitamin D supplementation during the first year. Now, they ascertained vitamin D supplementation during the first year. Whether or not the child that was taking it in the first year took it in the third or the fourth or the fifth, that's unknown. Because this data happens to be just for children who were taking the supplement during the first year. Well, well now, the question may come up. Well, how can vitamin D have this kind of an effect? have such a powerful effect. We know that vitamin D has effects many cells, almost every, every cell in the body literally responds well to it. Now, Cedric Garland mentioned earlier today about the role of vitamin D as something very basic in a multicellular organism. That's how we see it. And it has many different fact, many different activities, but one that we think is the main activity, or at least we're proposing it in this case, no one knows the absolute mechanism of this, but it's a likely one, and that is, is that when you are 
uh, replete with vitamin D, your cells are well connected to each other, and cells that are well connected to each other communicate with each other, and they have a very powerful barrier function. That's what your skin does, or other cells in your body. They have a barrier function to keep out one kind of an invader or not. If you become very low in vitamin D, the cells tend to separate. And a number of things happen. One is that de-evolution because the cell is on its own. And another thing that we think can happen is when it separates, you open up a gap between cells, and that can allow different things to go through, whether it's an antigen or whether it's a whether it's an immune cell. There are other things that vitamin D does independently. For it, for instance, it's considered an immune modulator, and maybe it has some effect directly on the immune cells. But let's look at this in terms of sort of the combination of what we learned. One, that there might be an agent, it might be a Virus, and two, that vitamin D is very protective, un un unquestionably protective. In fact, for causation, you usually need in epidemiology a couple of different factors. One, you need a temporal sequence. And we definitely have a temporal sequence. In that 30-year study, or in the one in Norway, that exposure to the vitamin D was before the development of the disease. And that's almost universal in most studies of vitamin D. We can get pre-diagnostic serum, or at least when we can, we really like it, because that gives the temporal sequence. You have to have the exposure before the disease. Another thing that you have to have, or you like to have, is a consistency of association. That's why we look at different populations when we can and see something. You like to see a dose response, if that's at all possible. And we have a dose response. In this case, the literature isn't re replete with a lot of studies, but the ones that are there are very clear, and there does seem to be a dose response with vitamin D. So most of the characteristics, or in fact all the characteristics for causality, there's a couple of other characteristics. One is strength of association. You can't get much stronger in anything in medicine and epidemiology than a reduction by 80% with a exposure to a substance. That's like a relative risk of 10 going the other way. Very, very high, so you have a very powerful association. And lastly, one of the things that's sometimes included in causation in epidemiology is specificity of the effect. Well, that doesn't count for vitamin D because almost every cell in the body reacts to vitamin D, and as we know, there's a lot of diseases that vitamin D affects, so that one, <clears throat> that one is not relevant to vitamin D. Well, anyway, looking at this, if we just want to go along with this proposed uh, idea where you have a lumen of a, of a cell, I mean of an artery or some kind of a vessel, and you have a very tight capillary endothelium, the cells are closely aligned with each other, that barrier between the cells, they're talking to each other, they're behaving properly, and there's a good strong barrier and they're keeping out invaders, you get vitamin D deficient, and this otherwise good barrier, this vascular barrier, opens up. And for one, for, for to begin with, in one case, what might happen is, is it opens up to the point and it allows an antigen, in this case a virus, to creep into the Langerhan cell area where it shouldn't be and perhaps infect those beta cells. And then the infection is over, but the body doesn't realize that it's over and the body continues to attack and kill all of the beta cells that create insulin. That's the one thing we know about this disease is that definitely pathology, and that is, is that, that you, know, it's, you, you are killing your own beta cells, your immune cells are killing your own beta cells. If you also don't have a good barrier because you're deplete, in vitamin D, it may also allow these other cells that don't belong in the Langerhans area, in the islet, the white blood cells and, and other kinds of leukocytes to invade more freely. And that may be one reason why, one thing about type 1 diabetes is it can get worse and it can get better and it can get worse and it can get better and that's been somewhat uh, un, uh, un, for unknown reasons. Well, it may be that some of these barriers are fluctuating in terms of how effective they are as a barrier <clears throat> depending on vitamin D, and that's why we see seasonality in this particular disease. Well, let's go back now and take a look at the information and what we had here. And this was our initial mystery. This is our epidemic, and it's our epidemic that was slowly climbing here and then the rate of increase increased. And let's see if what we found out and what we now know about the possible role of vitamin D can help explain this particular mystery. <clears throat> well, very interesting thing was occurring in Finland during this time. Be at the very beginning of this epidemic, in 1964, 
The recommended amount of supplementation for infants in Finland was 4,500 to 2,000 international units. Now the reason why that's so high is because as we were talking about, that country is at extremely high latitude and so they can make almost no vitamin D from exposure to sunlight and that's certainly true for most of the year. So they've always been very alert to the need for vitamin D in their diet and they would routinely and recommend fortification at that level. They then dropped the level from 4,500 to 2,000 IU right there in 1965. And that's when this epidemic started to go up. In 1975, and I suspect there's someone in this audience, probably Dr. Haney, could tell us why they made these changes over time. But it was, you know, people have lost interest in vitamin D, thought that there's no such thing as adult deficiency, and thought the only problem was rickets over time. So the interest began to wane. And when you see the interest waning, you see the dosage recommendations going down. So as we're climbing up here, when they dropped it to 2,000, right around here they dropped it to 1,000 international units. And someone in the audience already pointed that out and the epidemic continued to rise. Now what we noted in the first time we looked at this graph was this increase in rise right there and there's an inflection point and that inflection point is right there in the early 1990s and that's when they dropped the recommendation for vitamin D supplementation in infants in Finland to 400 IU per day and you can see what that did to the epidemic that was occurring. Yes? How were infants and children getting most of their vitamin D? Was it through cod liver oil or what, how were they actually getting it way back in 64 and 75? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, this was the recommended dose and I don't think, I, I know that cod liver oil was commonly used in the area. Does the person that knew that it was 1,000 IU want to make a comment on it? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. But that's the recommended dose. We know that some used cod liver oil, but also there was widespread vitamin D supplementation just as D3 in the country at that time. Now, given this, and given that this country was so interested in this, and given what we know, and there's this wonderful researcher, Hyponin is her name, and she was the one that headed up the studies, the 30-year study of the infants, and had this particular finding that <coughs> more than eight out of ten cases could be prevented by supplementation with vitamin D and they did that very wonderful study well unfortunately her conclusion and the conclusion of those authors was that we suggest that before any changes are made health workers ensure that all infants are receiving at least the amount of vitamin D indicated in the current recommendation and that current recommendation was 400 IUs per day right there. So we're not going to make that same mistake today. Yes, question. Well, in, these, in these other years, do you know this is just a recommendation? This is, there is no way to know if they were actually taking this? Well, that's a very good point. And one, one does wonder about that because do people just instantly change and there's a, you'd expect a period of, you know, maybe easing off and do recommendations change that quickly. I think that, uh, you know, I, I have discussed this with people and because it was infants that were given the supplement by the mother and by the pediatrician under care, recommendations get taken pretty quickly and pretty importantly unless you know, in that particular setting more than they would like. You wouldn't even know if a recommendation changed perhaps in the U.S. for an adult population. But it's thought that the recommendation was, you know, covered pretty quickly and, and followed pretty quickly in this, in this particular population. And, you know, that, that is a, that, that's an inflection point. You, you know, it, it, I tend to think that it's, that it's a piece of information and that, you know, that, that epidemic won't go down. Well, as I said, this was published in 2000 and not in, or actually not that one, this, uh, this finding was published not in an obscure journal, but in the Lancet in 2000 that you could reduce it this much. And yet there's still, still been no action taken. And partially because the recommendation was that 400 is apparently enough. Well, that was said before, but I, I, don't, want to, I don't think that's going to be enough. We don't want to make that same mistake because if we want to slow down that epidemic, which is our job as epidemiologists and as health advisors and providers and researchers, why not 